Welcome to this edition of 5 Minute Bays. Here to help me today is Tenzin, age six and a half. What I'd like to talk about for this edition is the weakness of power. Now imagine we have a null hypothesis, H0, an alternative hypothesis, H1. A common situation is we'd like to know whether we have good enough evidence for H0, good enough evidence for H1, or no evidence to speak of. Now a problem with significance testing is that p-values do not make a three-way distinction, they only make a two-way distinction, to the extent they make the relevant distinction at all. So they distinguish these states of affairs from evidence for H1. But they in no way distinguish evidence for the null for no evidence to speak, to speak of. So no matter what the p-value, no distinction is made within this box. So you cannot say, for example, because my p-value was as high as 0.9, therefore the null hypothesis must be true or is likely, or there's good evidence for the null hypothesis. You cannot say that. A p-value of 0.9 may indicate merely that you have a large standard error, the data are insensitive, and you cannot make any distinction between H0 and H1. Base factors, on the other hand, make the required three-way distinction. So a sufficiently small base factor indicates good enough evidence for H0, sufficiently large base factor, good enough evidence for H1, and the base factor around 1, no evidence to speak of. Now people have realised for some time that p-values are poor for indicating evidence for H0. So for example, Robert Rosenfeld indicated decades ago that there's a file draw problem whereby people bury non-significant results because they realise that non-significance alone is non-evidential. But this leads to a biased record, a biased publication record, and therefore biased evidence concerning the effects that we're really interested in. Now the problem is deeper than this. There's not just a problem of burying non-significant results. There's the converse problem of inferring the null hypothesis from mere non-significance. So for example, I took a recent issue of the Journal of Experimental Psychology Journal and found that except in one paper that did use Bayesian techniques, in all other papers, non-significance alone was taken as support for null hypothesis. That is, the mere fact of non-significance, with no other uh, basis like talking about power, was used to assert there was no interaction, that performance was a baseline, or to assert some other null hypothesis. But this is completely groundless. So the rules psychologists seem to follow are these. If a key result is non-significant, bury the study. If the key result is significant, then use any other non-significant result in the study. Use that mere fact of non-significance to support any null hypothesis you please, willy-nilly. Both of these practices are dangerous for our science. Now, the orthodox solution, or the key one, is power. And I'd like to talk about power and why it does not solve the problem. Now, a key point about power is it must be calculated in advance. That is, it, that the power you calculate cannot be based on the obtained data. Now, this is very strange that we want to know how sensitive the data are for discriminating H0 from H1, but we cannot use the data themselves in order to do that. But I'd like to show you with an example why this is strange. So let's say for H1, the predicted effect size is a Cohen's D of 0.8, standardized effect size of 0.8. So to get a power of 95%, we need 19 subjects. So we run 19 subjects, and we end up with an effect size of 0.4. Now, if the standard deviation of the study was exactly that as estimated for the power calculation, that will give us a P of 0.1. That is, this is non-significant. So what we have is a high-powered experiment and a non-significant result. So according to orthodox statistics, we should assert the null hypothesis. 
Let's try here, but the sample means it's exactly in the middle. Yes, well spotted. That's exactly right. The sample mean is exactly in the middle. It's halfway between the prediction of the null hypothesis and that of H1. So there cannot possibly be more evidence for one theory rather than the other. In fact, it's completely non-evidential. And not only this, standard deviations are themselves highly variable. So it would be very easy to get a, say, a standard deviation 25% larger than the one estimated for the power calculation, in which case the p would be 0.18 and non-significant for a sample mean exactly in the middle. And you might say very non-significant. A high-powered experiment, non-significant result, you might think that license you, licenses you to assert the null hypothesis. Of course, according to conventional statistics, it does. But there is no evidence, despite this license, there is no evidence for the null hypothesis rather than this H1. In fact, if I calculate the base factor using 0.8 as the uh, rough scale of effect size that we're interested in, and using one of my rules of thumb, a half normal, the standard deviation of 0.8, we get a base factor here of 2.13, which actually indicates more evidence for H1 than H0. And that's because even though we're interested in effect size of 0.8, likely effect sizes will be lower than this. And in this case, with the SD 25% larger, the base factor is closer to 1, but it's still more. So now in this case, the base factor is 1.44 closer to one, but still more than one. And again, it's more than one because we're not assuming there's a single possible population value, but values smaller than this are actually quite likely. Now, let's consider a converse sort of case where, again, we're trying to pick up an effect size of 0.8, but now we run only 10 subjects, so the power is 60%. And we obtain a sample mean of 0.2 in the wrong direction, according to the theory, which is non-significant. So now we have a low-powered non-significant result. And if this power was too small for your purposes, we wouldn't be licensed to conclude anything. But in fact, because the sample mean happens to go in the wrong direction for the theory, and it's closer to the null than the point predicted by the theory. This is more evidence, this is strong evidence for the null rather than the theory. In fact, if we use the same half normal as we did before, so assuming a distribution of possible values with 0.8 as a scaling factor, we get a base factor of 0.24 which would be substantial evidence for the null hypothesis, despite the fact we had a low power experiment. So in sum, we can have a high powered experiment and a non-significant result that does not provide evidence for the null hypothesis. And we can have a low powered experiment and a non-significant result, which does provide evidence for the null hypothesis. So to know how much evidence data provide for the null over the alternative, Power cannot be used. You must use a base factor.